Hello there guys, and welcome back to another installment of Trey the Explainer. Hope you're all having a good holiday break. Sorry for the delay with this video, I've recently hit a massive writer's block, the biggest in a while, for several video scripts, including the much anticipated Megalania one, so I decided to just talk about something else entirely for the time being, because I was getting nowhere. Today we are back with another special episode of Cryptid Profile. Cryptids or proposed undiscovered organisms can be found pretty much anywhere people are around to claim to have seen them. From the Yeti of the Himalayas, to the Mothman of West Virginia, to the Ahul of Java, cryptids are reported everywhere. And it's the job of science to address these creatures. Are they real, yet to be identified species, or simply cases of mistaken identity or hoaxes? Well, in science, the first step is to look at the evidence. The vast majority of the evidence for such creatures is anecdotal, that is solely based off of eyewitness reports. A glimpse in the darkness, a distant figure in the woods. Arguably the weakest form of evidence, people can easily become deceived or lie. However, this isn't always the case. Physical evidence, such as photographs and videos to footprints, crop up from time to time, and such lines of evidence can give some scientists pause. But then again, such things can be hoaxed or explained. For this reason, the most valuable, but also the rarest physical evidences for cryptids must be actual body parts and remains of the reported creatures, which is what we will be talking about today. The value of cryptid remains such as hair, blood, skeletons, feces, skin, etc. cannot be overstated, as unlike with photos or eyewitness reports, something extremely important that can verify their authenticity beyond a shadow of a doubt can be obtained from them. DNA. Ah, DNA, that little double helix that exists in every single one of our cells, in all of those of every animal on this planet. And captured in that DNA is an extremely treasured set of sequences of T's and G's and A's and C's that provide geneticists with a unique family tree of evolutionary relationships of that owner of that genetic material. For instance, if you were to take my DNA base sequences and compare them with those of all other animals, not only should mine be distinctly human, but because of my ancestors' evolutionary history, my DNA should be most similar to other humans. After that, we would find that it is most similar to that of a chimpanzee's, then after that a gorilla's, and then after that an orangutan's, and so on. My genetic family tree proves that I am a homo sapien, and a type of ape, and a mammal. The DNA don't lie, and if you really are who you say you are, your DNA should prove it. Funny how something so small, microscopic in fact, could mean so much. Going back to cryptids, if Bigfoot exists, he bleeds, he loses hair, and must use the restroom, and by the collection of such bodily structures and fluids, we can obtain his DNA, which would prove a uniquely Squatchian genetic sequence and evolutionary relationship. You just can't do that with photos and sightings. It's pretty much as close to irrefutable evidence as you can get. For this reason, I think with every cryptid, the only way to completely prove its existence is through DNA. It is only DNA, or an actual living, breathing, caged creature, that will fully put an end to the conjecture and the skepticism, making a cryptid a cryptid no longer. The DNA would be further verified when accepted and cataloged by GenBank. We would have to assign the organism owner of the DNA a proper name. In Bigfoot's case, likely the predetermined Homo sapiens cognatus, and maybe look for some more physical evidence to further verify its authenticity. This is exactly what happened to the Sonyala, or the Asian unicorn, one of the last large mammals to be identified and discovered by science. In 1992, three sets of horns were discovered in the homes of hunters in Vietnam. DNA testing confirmed that the horns belonged to an as-of-yet undescribed species of bovid, the group that encompasses goats, cows, and antelopes. It was only until 1999 a photograph of this incredibly rare and elusive animal was taken in the wild using a trail cam. The Sonyala had been known through its DNA collected from trophies for years before the actual creature was seen. Something possible could be done with cryptids like Bigfoot. All we would need is something as modest and simple as a single drop of blood, such as those that so easily drip from my nose when the weather is dry in autumn. So, what do we find? Well, every now and then, physical remains of cryptids are reported, mere hairs to entire colossal rotting corpses, and scientists are eager to examine these findings for DNA testing. And I know I already kind of tackled some of this with globsters, but I decided with this video that I will examine some of the reported DNA evidence for some of the big, famous cryptids. So, without further ado, cryptid DNA. 
Oh, I guess it's that day. I'm finally getting around to talking about the big boy himself, Bigfoot. Well, kind of. The hairy man cryptid archetype is perhaps the most prominent and widely dispersed cryptid type out there, from Australia's Yowie to North America's Bigfoot to East Asia's Yeti. The fur-covered, upright-walking humanoid is seen on almost every continent, apparently spotted by individuals belonging to entirely unrelated cultures and societies, which to some provides evidence of their authenticity. But to me, I think just the hairy man is an incredibly easy-to-construct monster. Just take a human and add some more hair. It isn't too difficult to visualize. It makes sense that the most primitive and most common monsters and mythical creatures humanity would fabricate would be based around the animal they are most familiar with, humans themselves. Regardless, throughout history, hairy men have been glimpsed in swamps, plains, mountaintops, and forests, and these most famous cryptids have consequently the most reported physical evidence. Hundreds, if not thousands, of reported hairs, blood, and tissue samples said to belong to Sasquatch, Yeti, Orang Pendek, and other hairy man cryptid variants have been claimed throughout the decades. But what does science have to say about this? Well, the largest problem scientists encounter is that although there is a lot of testing being done, with every year or so somebody new claims to have discovered unidentified primate DNA, almost all of these studies do not go through the normal scientific process of peer review. Most famously, a DNA study headed by a Melba Ketchum in a veterinary laboratory reported to the media to have analyzed 109 samples of Bigfoot specimens and verified that some belong to an unidentified new species of primate. However, the Ketchum project was a disaster as her work was turned down by all of the scientific journals and publications as they believed her methods to be unsatisfactory and the evidence did not support her conclusions provided in her paper. Ketchum later announced that her results were finally published in the De Novo Journal of Science. The journal is, I don't want to say a fraud, but um... The Huffington Post discovered that the journal's domain had been registered anonymously only nine days before the announcement. This was the only edition of De Novo, and was listed as Volume 1, Issue 1, with its only content being the Ketchum paper. It seems the journal was created explicitly just to skirt around the normal methods of publication and peer review. Actual geneticists who read the paper were extremely unimpressed with the research, and no data or analyses were provided to support the claim made by Ketchum. Ketchum additionally made rather politically charged public statements concerning her research. Yes, I guess you could come up with an elaborate conspiracy theory suggesting that real scientists want to hide the truth of the Bigfoot by suppressing the research of the fringe through the process of peer review. But that's the kind of thing people like Alex Jones and the Ancient Alien guys come up with. The Star of Bethlehem wasn't used as a navigation point. The star was possibly a UFO. I find it is far more likely that it is the other way around. And the Ketchum incident is just another example of why the peer review system works so well in science, because it calls out mistakes and errors for what they are. Unethical and unscientific practices such as this are common with research about Bigfoot and other cryptids. It makes finding verifiable and objective research into Bigfoot DNA extremely difficult. But don't lose hope. There are a few neat publications of extensive research put into these samples that have been peer-reviewed and double-checked for accuracy. Genetic analysis of hair samples attributed to Yeti, Bigfoot, and other anomalous primates published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B Biological Sciences and conducted by a joint study between the University of Oxford and the Cantonal Museum of Zoology is one of these examples. The paper analyzed 30 hair samples attributed to what the paper dubbed anomalous primates. Samples ranged widely geographically from the Pacific Northwest to the United States to Bhutan to Russia. Hair samples were compared to gin or gene bank catalogs of known animal species DNA. So what did the DNA find? Firstly, some hair samples turned out to not even be hairs at all. Some were plant material or glass fibers. As for those that were genetic material, when compared to known animals, all of the 30 samples belonged to known animals, all but two belonging to common animals of their respective regions. Black and brown bears accounted for the vast majority of the samples. The other samples belonged to a wide range of common animals, cow, horse, dog, wolf, coyote, sheep, goat, raccoon, porcupine, deer, and tapir. Only one sample belonged to a primate. This sample from Texas belonged to none other than a homo sapien, a human. There were two samples, however, that yielded a very unexpected result. 
Both were said to belong to a yeti. One came from Bhutan, the other from northern India. The yeti DNA was apparently closest to that of a fossilized genetic sample of a 40,000-year-old polar bear from the Ice Age. This is strange because polar bears do not currently inhabit either region. The DNA could possibly represent an ancient relic population in the region. However, a later study disputed this finding and identified the hares as belonging to an incredibly rare type of brown bear. Regardless, the study debunked the claim that the hares belong to an unknown species of primate. There have been several similar published papers that have conducted and concluded on the same findings. Evolutionary history of enigmatic bears in the Tibetan Plateau Himalaya region and the identity of the yeti identified all nine yeti samples, some hares, some bones. Eight belonged to bears, characteristic of the region, the other one was a dog. A yeti hand and scalp was reportedly held in the Pangbosh Monastery in Nepal before both were stolen in 1991. A finger of the hand was spared this fate and was tested by the University of Edinburgh. The finger yielded DNA of a human, the hand probably belonging to a long-dead monk. The scalp was not recovered and is likely lost somewhere in the black market trade right now, but it most likely belonged to a bear or mountain goat, like so much other yeti paraphernalia. There are a few other papers that have yielded similar conclusions. As far as science is concerned, it appears the ape-man legend and folklore have not been proven. Every single DNA sample of a Sasquatch or Yeti that has come in has belonged to known animals. But who knows, maybe someday we'll get lucky with one of these chokers, which have evaded us for so long, messing up somewhere. Or, there's an elaborate conspiracy among scientists to cover up the existence of ape men, as well as the reptilian overlords that control our government and worship Satan. Alright, let's switch gears to perhaps the second most famous cryptid out there, the one and only Loch Ness Monster. As we have already talked about in the previous three-part video series, it appears the Loch Ness Monster was more of a popular culture craze of its time, likely influenced by the release of King Kong, rather than an actual undiscovered plesiosaur, dinosaur, or aquatic reptile in general. As far as I know, there are no reported DNA samples of Nessie, like there are with Bigfoot, the Yeti, and other anomalous apes. However, I wanted to make an excuse to talk about something super interesting, and I think has large reaching effects as it relates to undiscovered organisms such as cryptids. Roughly a year ago, a study was organized and announced by a joint effort between the Loch Ness Center, the Loch Ness Project, and several major universities. The study would be similar to the ones performed on Bigfoot and his relatives with DNA evidence being used to identify known or unknown organisms. However, this time, the researchers wouldn't have hair or blood or bone samples of the creature. The researchers would instead use a relatively recent and emerging tool to discover Nessie, eDNA. Now, what is eDNA? eDNA stands for environmental DNA. And, as the name implies, it is any genetic material of organisms collected from samples of the environment, like in water, soil, snow, and even air, rather than taken from the actual animal directly. At almost each and every moment of the day, pieces of you break off and are dispersed into your environment. Skin, hair, poop, urine, eggs, sperm, etc. This craft, literally in some cases, contains trace amounts of your DNA and gets mixed in with the dirt or water, leaving behind a subtle genetic trail or footprint of you in the area. Your DNA also gets mixed in with the DNA of your neighbors, birds, fish, rats, cats, and everything you can think of, leaving behind an unintentional genetic surveillance system of all the creatures that live in the area. EDNA is a really neat and up-and-coming development in genetics that is starting to produce some exciting and truly promising results. We may no longer need hair or blood samples taken directly off the animal. We could instead gleam all we would need from a small vial of soil or water. Similar fascinating studies using eDNA have been published, and it has been especially useful in detecting rare and elusive species in a region. In 2011, biologists used the method to detect the DNA of the Asian carp in the canals around Chicago, suggesting the invasive fish species exists in the region, even though they have rarely been spotted. Wildlife researchers have used eDNA collected from snow and forests to detect the presence of lynx, polar bear, arctic fox, and wolverine by simply collecting the snow along game trails. The last known extremely endangered Alabama sturgeon lost its tracking tag in 2009, leaving researchers unclear on the species' survival. 
However, eDNA testing yielded 18 positive DNA samples of the sturgeons in the Alabama River, confirming their survival. Another groundbreaking use of eDNA recently was in 2016, where it was used on a massive swarm of whale sharks off of Qatar to estimate the number of breeding female sharks in the Indo-Pacific population. The researchers yielded an estimated 71,000 breeding females, which was double-checked using independently obtained tissue samples. The eDNA estimation was incredibly close to the estimation given by the tissue samples, illustrating that eDNA in samples of water can reliably be used to not only identify organisms in a habitat, but give you a pretty accurate survey of the makeup of animals in the entire ecosystem, including the proportion of the animals to one another. Perhaps my favorite use of eDNA was in 2017, where it was used to identify trace amounts of Neanderthal and Donisivan DNA in soil samples collected deep within caves. Thousands of years after these humans had become extinct, their DNA could still be found in the dirt. Probably for this reason, eDNA is currently reportedly being used to detect the death location of the mysteriously disappeared aviator, Amelia Earhart, by using soil samples of Pacific Islands. Getting back to Nessie, sorry for the digression, eDNA was suggested to be used to survey the organisms living in Loch Ness, with hopes of identifying some known or unknown species that has found its way into the loch, like a whale's catfish or salmon, or even a monster. If a late Mesozoic survivor is to be found in the loch, then its DNA, proving that it is a long-lost branch of reptile, should be found, as well mixed with the DNA of countless fish and other species of animal that call the loch home. In June 2018, the team collected 259 samples from various parts of the loch, including at its deepest points. The findings of the study are supposed to be released sometime in January 2019, so fingers crossed, man will that be really really weird if in a month or two the results come out that there's DNA of an unknown reptile in the loch. Uh, holy crap, looks like I was wrong. Regardless, with environmental DNA, very soon cryptids will have no place to hide from science. Our methods are getting better and better each decade, and if there are any cryptids just waiting to be discovered, all we would need is just one lucky soil or water sample. The game of hide-and-seek is getting harder and harder every year, and eventually, there will be nowhere left for these cryptids to run, with Morning Comes Mistfall style. And with that, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new. This video was a ton of fun to make and research for. There may be a part 2 to this topic as I did leave out some cryptids like the mysterious canines of the Americas, and countless reported alien corpses discovered over the years, so stay tuned for a part 2. Until then, I've been Trey the Explainer, and hope you have a great day. I'll see you for the 2018 Paleontology Recap. Alright, see ya!